welcome to Talk Trillium. My name is Patty Cochran, Senior Vice President and Chief Innovation Officer at Trillium Health Partners, which consists of the Credit Valley Hospital, the Mississauga Hospital, and the Queensway Health Centre. I'll be your host today on Talk Trillium as we speak to you about the work we are doing to create a new kind of health care for a healthier community. Today I'm really pleased to welcome my two guests, Catherine Hayward-Murray, she's the Senior Vice President for Patient Services and our Chief Nursing Executive, Hi. and Chris Settler. Chris Settler is a manager of our professional practice and something called a BPSO lead, which we will explain in a minute. But before we start talking to our two guests today, we'd like to talk, uh, see a quick video that really speaks about how Trillium is constantly seeking to improve the quality of care that we deliver. And it's through adopting things uh, called high quality standards or best practices. So let's hear a little bit more about our initiative for best practice spotlight organization. Welcome to Trillium Health Partners, to our first uh, Best Practice Spotlight Organization Champions Networking Open House. So the purpose of today is to uh, speak to each other about what you're doing in your best practice guidelines, sharing your stories, and guiding each other to, uh, to learn as much as you can from your champion colleagues. First off, it's all about patients. And the work that you are doing is all about patient care. And it's not only about patient care in the here and now, in terms of promoting best practice and uh, in really perfecting the work that you do at the bedside and across the hospital. But it was also fundamentally about the new areas that we were becoming very, very much uh, aligned around in our new hospital, and that was research and education. But I really want you to look for opportunities to leverage your experience and your work as partners together in strengthening our organization at all levels for patient care, for quality patient care, for education, for research, and fundamentally in creating an organization where we can, together, better together, be fundamentally successful for many generations to come. This was the initiative that would bring together the 3,000 nurses and 1,500 allied health across the organization. This was the initiative that was going to deliver on that promise to our community that they could expect a standardized approach based on evidence, based on research, in the way that we were going to deliver care. This is a change in the way of being uh, in your entire organization, not only for nurses, but for everyone, as you look at creating an evidence-based community in your organization. So the best practice guidelines that we chose for the organization, we chose them um, strategically. They were areas of practice where we weren't necessarily implementing them in the same uniform way. They are areas where our patients have told us uh, on their surveys, for instance, that we could do better. So the best practice guidelines that we're implementing at Trillium Health Partners are smoking cessation, developing and sustaining leadership, falls prevention, assessment and management of pain, prevention of foot ulcers in patients with diabetes, and breastfeeding. So the role of Mackenzie Health as the BPSO mentor for Trillium Health Partners is to engage with the uh, coordinator, the co-leads, and um, champions within uh, Trillium Health to look at ways to facilitate best practice guidelines at the point of care. So it's about problem solving, um, listening, reflecting and really sharing our experiences so that um, Trillium Health Partners can learn from those who have gone before them. Becoming a best practice spotlight organization uh, will come to mean to our community that we stand for quality, 
and that we believe in quality. We have three years to become a BPSO and uh, at, it, it never ends. It's not a project, it's a lifestyle change. So at the end of three years, uh, we will continue our good work. We will implement more best practice guidelines and we will strengthen our practice and uh, make sure that we are providing the best quality of care for patients. That was a wonderful uh, video that showed us the beginning, I'd say, of your journey. Catherine, can you tell us a little bit more about how many healthcare professionals work at Trillium Health Partners? Sure. Um, across our three sites, um, we have 3,000 nurses, roughly about 3,000 nurses. We have 1,500 allied health. So when we say allied health, um, that's kind of a, a blanket for physiotherapists, speech language, dietitians, respiratory therapists. So a really great cadre of, of and, and component of our team. And then I always like to mention our physicians. So about a thousand physicians and never forget our 2000 volunteers. And that makes up our total uh, complement of our team at, at Trillium Health Partners. That's a lot of people. It is a ton of people, Patty. And they work across three sites. Correct. So tell me, Catherine, as the leader for this group, how do you ensure that they're delivering the best possible care and that they're actually delivering the same type of care across the three sites? So Patty, every, every profession has a college that they're accountable for uh, or to. And so uh, based on that, you, you do bring in staff that have a, standard, a standardized approach in the way that they've been educated and in the way that they have to achieve quality on an annual basis. So we use that as a foundation. So into the hospital they come. Once they're in the hospital, we decide what are our standards of practice that we now want our professionals and allied health and um, our nurses to adhere to so that we are providing a consistent uh, level of care to our patients. And so through the years, as you can imagine, as different people are trained at different times and different practices have been different through the years, there needs to be research and evidence that's, uh, that's acquired around what are the best practices that are gonna get us to the best outcomes. And so the initiative that you're hearing about today is um, a body of work that's been done that, that informs us as to what are those best practices. We can bring those to Trillium Health Partners and spread those across our teams so that we are delivering a consistent approach to the care. Thank you for that. Chris, a question for you. You, you are the leader of the BPSO <coughs> guideline work. Can you talk, describe a little bit more uh, about the details behind some of that work? Mm -hmm. um, the, the work is really a partnership with the Registered Nurses Association of Ontario, and they support us for three years, and then even after our designation to um, well, in, in many different ways. So the guidelines themselves, as you mentioned, are evidence-based and they do all the research up front um, and uh, make sure that the, the guidelines are, are current and, uh, and evidence-based, as I said. Then we begin with education of staff and developing a network of champions. And that is really the key thing is having um, staff in every area of the organization who are helping to promote the practice um, every every day. So you mentioned a network of champions. So their role, the champions role, is to educate the rest of the staff in an area? Is that their role? or um, it, s Sometimes, or some of their role, but uh, it's other things too. It's uh, um, you know, everyone has the education, but then just reminding people that this is how we practice. It's often a change from what people were doing. Uh, people by nature tend to go back to their, uh, the habits uh, that they were accustomed to. So it's just reminding, uh, pushing uh, the practices forward, um, using uh, uh, reports to um, celebrate the changes or to uh, say this is where we need to improve. Now the video we saw that was the very beginning of your journey. How far into that journey are we today? 
So we are very close to the end. Um, in wow. March 2015 is really uh, when we um, move into what's called our post-designation period. And that period, um, we are expected to maintain the changes that we've made, but also to introduce uh, two new guidelines um, uh, as well and uh, continue not only to uh, maintain the practices in our own organization, but to assist and mentor organizations who are just coming on board to be B BPSOs. Great. So Catherine, um, has there been an impact for our patients and our families? Absolutely, Patty. As we've, as we've merged our organizations and our former, former Trillium Health Center and Credit Valley, as you know, one of our biggest commitments to our community was that we were going to provide the highest quality, the safest care across all three of our sites. So if you were a resident of this community, regardless of what door you put your hand on to open up and enter into, you would be provided with the highest quality, the safest care. So what this initiative does is allow us to say, this is the way we're going to do the care and educate, as Chris pointed out, all of our professionals, all the folks that we talked about, in certain aspects of the way they'll deliver care. So that consistency will be provided regardless. And, and so for our community, that means that they can expect a certain level of care that is based on evidence that they can be assured that they're going to get the highest quality and so that their outcomes will be the best. Great. Mm -hmm. And Chris, just in 30 seconds or mm -hmm. less, what's been the impact for staff? Mm. Um, staff have been very involved. Um, it has, I think, been helpful for them to um, operationalize the guidelines within their areas so that uh, they've actually told us what will work best in the area where they practice to make sure that quality happens and it's operationalized in a way that makes sense. I think it was a perfect initiative, particularly in light of our recent merger. Uh, thank you both for joining us today. And stay tuned, we're gonna come back after the break. We're gonna hear a little bit more about the breastfeeding BPSO. Stay tuned. Welcome back to Talk Trillium, Partnering for Patients. This segment, we're going to talk a little bit more about breastfeeding. Uh, as one of the best practice spotlight organizational practices at Trillium Health Partners. And we know that breastfeeding is a very positive thing for both moms and babies, with long-lasting emotional and physical uh, benefits. And even though it's natural, it isn't always easy. Let's take a closer look. So when the doctor came in um, to tell me that we were going to have a cesarean, I, I felt quite afraid, um, nervous as well, uh, anxious about not knowing what to expect. However, having my husband there, uh, seeing that his emotion initially was fear as well, uh, but then having him say to me, you know what, it's okay, we are going to get through this. Um, and I, and I said to him, well, what's gonna happen with the breastfeeding? And he was like, don't worry, we will get through that. Um, so once the, the baby was born, I was expecting it to be a little bit of a challenge, but I found that it was a lot more because I was so tired and so sore. Um, but having the nurse's support, having my husband's support, really helped to make that breastfeeding experience very positive. At the beginning, it takes a lot of commitment, I found, at least for me. But really sticking and being determined that breastfeeding is all that you need and baby is full on the colostrum, um, you can do it. You know, breastfeeding is a little bit of a challenge at the beginning. When my milk came in, day three, day four, um, things were much better. Very hungry, huh? You need to be mentally um, 
prepared and tell yourself that you want to breastfeed first. You need to find the support. So for me, it was my husband and my mom. Um, we also, after the baby was born, we um, went to the breastfeeding clinic. We've uh, attended a, a Leche League meeting as well, just to get as much support in the community with regards to the breastfeeding. Breastfeeding is, is the one thing that you, makes you really feel connected to your kids, um, and it's free. <laughs> That's a big thing, and it's possible. So I, I would say breastfeeding is possible. That, that would be my line, I think. <laughs> Congratulations. If your doctor or midwife has told you that you are likely to have a cesarean birth, here are some suggestions to help you and your baby get off to a good start. Congratulations, Jessica and Andy. Most mothers are awake during their baby's cesarean birth. The relaxation exercises you learned in your prenatal classes will help you now and during your recovery. It's very important for babies to be held or placed skin to skin as soon as possible after the birth. Your physician and nurse will help you with this. Skin to skin contact helps babies adjust to life outside the womb by keeping them warm and controlling their heart rate, breathing and blood sugar. It also soothes and comforts babies, helps moms relax and improves breastfeeding success. The nurse may also encourage your partner to hold the baby skin to skin. It's an amazing experience to share with your newborn. Babies like to feed at night because the hormone that helps your body make more milk is higher at night. Sometimes my baby would have a stretch of feeding non-stop, especially in the evening or during the night. The nurse told me that this was normal. She called it cluster feeding. At first, I thought it was a sign that I didn't have enough milk for my baby. But in fact, this is the way my baby was telling my body to make more milk. Your partner or support person can help by discouraging too many visitors. Remember, feeding first, visitors second. Hello. Hi, John. How are you? Good, good. The baby's excellent. Melanie gave birth yesterday. She's just relaxing now. Baby's healthy, nine pounds, two ounces. No, we're delaying all visits until we get home. We're gonna be uh, coming home in a couple of days, so come visit us then, okay? Thanks. To prepare for these night feedings, nap as often as possible. It's really important that you uh, move. The more you move, it's better for your blood circulation and it'll help you feel better and faster. Medication for pain will encourage you to remain active after the birth, which in turn promotes good blood flow, especially to your legs. Getting up and moving around will also relieve abdominal gas. My hope is that women don't take C-section as a deterrent to breastfeed. Don't say, oh, C-section can't breastfeed. No, but rather think, okay, you know, it's just another challenge. Um, and know that breastfeeding is possible with a cesarean and the benefits of breastfeeding for me with my children have been tremendous. Um, and they have memories of mommy's breast milk, which is lovely. Um, I know that they'll carry on into their future and may and will influence their families. So we'll hopefully, you know, support their wives or their partners to breastfeed um, because of those lovely memories that they have. It's my pleasure to welcome our guest today. Christina, you're a relatively new mom who delivered at Trillium Health Partners. Shelly Protaskovic, she's the manager of our professional practice. And Kamel Buta, who's a registered nurse who gets to work with new moms and babies every day. Uh, so my first question for you, Shelly, tell me a little bit more. You are the champion for the breastfeeding initiative. Tell me a little bit more about this initiative. So the Baby Friendly Initiative is an initiative really around providing information for our moms and our families so that they can make informed choices around feeding their babies. And we know all the evidence is there that breastfeeding is the best for both babes and moms. Huge links to um, decrease in infections, building bigger, uh, better immune systems, and also a real big link to childhood obesity. 
And so we know it's there and it's really about getting that information out to moms. And so getting on board with this initiative is trying to get that information to our moms and their families early so they can make the right choices for themselves. And then when they choose, it's to really support them in the process because like you saw in the video, you know, it's not always easy. And so the support is really key in surrounding yourself with that support. And has it made a difference? Yeah, I think it's made a huge difference because it's awareness, right? So once you have, you know, you're dedicated to taking on an initiative like this, it's really about bringing awareness to people. And I think probably the biggest difference is people understanding the small impact that they have. So one interaction can make such a difference at an integral point in someone's um, postpartum stay or in the delivery piece that really uh, can, you know, give them the confidence to continue on when it's really rough. And so I think as healthcare professionals, we can't underestimate uh, how important every interaction we have with our families is. So Kamal, you get to meet these new babies and new moms uh, in your working life. Tell us your approach under this initiative. Is it different than it, what it was before? Um, it sure was. Um, now we are more uh, like the baby friendly initiative. We uh, encourage um, um, research has shown that breastfeeding plays a big role and, and, and impacts the babies as they grow and in, in later parts of their life as well. Um, we start right from the birth, you know, uh, we changed our practices uh, right at the delivery time before we did not do a lot of skin to skin and that also played a major part in, uh, in the um, baby friendly initiative as well, uh, helping us promote breastfeeding and uh, bonding with the baby um, and um, that's the right way to go. So how many moms do, it, do go home uh, breastfeeding their newborns now? Is there a percentage or approximately? What's your success rate like? Um, we do, like, um, there are like around 99% of the moms who say that when they come into birthing suite that they want to exclusively breastfeed. Um, I'm not sure exactly how many. Um, I did know the number initially, but we do our audits every month and every quarterly, so the numbers do keep changing, and we have definitely improved from when we started the initiative, so we are headed the right way. So when we started the initiative, we actually were around 45% of our moms were going home exclusively breastfeeding. So even though 95% were coming in, there was a huge gap between those who were going home. Since then, we've been able to raise our numbers up to about 60%. So we're getting right. there. And it's a culture change, right? And so yes. it's something you have to be patient with and you have to be relentless and you've got to be in for the long haul. And so we're moving in the right direction. The staff are working incredibly hard and uh, I think we'll get there. Our goal is to reach 75%. Excellent. Yes. Christina, I'm guessing that you were part of the 60% successful moms at breastfeeding. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Tell me a little bit about your experience. Um, so for me, breastfeeding was really the only choice that, I've, that I had. Um, for me, I had a lot of support. Uh, I grew up with a family that was very pro breastfeeding. I had a great birth experience um, at Trillium Health Partners with um, a lot of support from the staff. Um, they made sure that my baby was on my chest right away for as long as possible um, and they helped my baby latch um, pretty much immediately and continued to help me every two hours the whole time I was at the hospital. So it's, um, since then it's been a great experience and probably the best choice that I've made for me and my baby. And so when you went home, uh, were you, did you have any issues or problems then? Um, for me, I didn't, but one of the things that was done for me at the hospital was a, um, a breastfeeding class before we left. So for me and my husband to go with all the other couples and see um, if we were having any trouble, we had a lactation consultant come right to our room before discharge, and then we were set up with an appointment at a breastfeeding clinic close by, um, close by our home for a couple of days postpartum. So I went there and I took my mother-in-law with me. Um, and got the support there that I was doing a great job and and uh, so for me it was it was a, a seamless transi transition from the hospital to home. And if you choose to have another child would you do it again? 100 percent. And any advice to viewers if they're contemplating breastfeeding? Um, I would say if you are a pregnant mom then uh, prenatal education is the most important thing that you can do. Uh, making educated informed decisions with you and your par partner or your spouse. Um, if you have a baby and you want to breastfeed, then to seek out the resources in the community that are there for you, that can help you, support you, encourage you. Um, 
and take control over those moments after birth when you've made your choices and how you want to feed your baby and make sure that people are around you that support your choices as well. Um, I think that that's the most important thing and, and ultimately to encourage new moms that you do have the ability to completely nourish your, your right. infant for the first six months of life Thank and beyond. You. And just quickly, Shelley, were there any other partners in the community? Because mm -hmm. we have moms in the home, but what happens when they go to the community? Absolutely. Who were our partners? Just in a couple of seconds. Yeah. So really important, and we couldn't do it without them, is our partners at Peel Public Health. They are instrumental in that con continuum of care and connecting care, right? So we have a little small piece at Children Health Partners, and that journey is really long. And they, they work prenatally, they work postnatally, and we couldn't do it without them. And we built our partnership and it's nice and strong now and it's just going to get stronger. Well, excellent. Thank you for joining me today and stay tuned uh, viewers. We will be coming back to learn more around foot complications. Talk Trillium. This segment we're going to talk about diabetic foot complications and joining us today we have three guests. Heather Nutbeam. Heather is a patient uh, who's had some experience in this. Rob Renton is our clinical educator in our medicine program but he's also the organization-wide project lead for this initiative and Fiona Ryan who's an RN who delivers uh, wound care uh, for this patient population. So maybe my first question to you Rob why is diabetic foot wounds and complications such an important initiative for Trillium Health Partners? Well, within our own community, uh, there's the Diabetes Management Center that I work with uh, uh, estimates there's about 70,000 patients in our community with diabetes. And of that 70,000 uh, patients, uh, about 2% two, two will go on to develop foot, uh, uh, foot complications and potentially wounds. And the wounds, interesting statistic, if you will, uh, a wound on the foot has a uh, higher mortality rate than, or a five-year mortality rate than breast cancer or prostate cancer. So it's a very significant indicator of of overall health or or uh, more mortality rates. And what is it about diabetes and and wound um, wounds that makes it more complicated? I think diabetics ha uh, fail to heal as rapidly. Is that absolutely? That's a big part of it. Yeah, they're their uh, ability to sense the wound in the bottom of their foot, the um, circulation is, af is affected. Uh, obviously, a wound, the, the, a wound in the foot is sort of an indicator then of overall health as well. It ob obviously, other parts of the body then are being affected by the uh, impaired circulation and uh, problems with healing, so it goes on to become problems for, for heart and kidney and so on. And the, that just becomes a spiral of, uh, of um, unfortunate ill health that uh, potentiates all these other, uh, and most specifically the wound healing in the foot that can become then gangrenous and lead to amputations or potentially death. Yes, yeah, so it's a very serious thing that needs a lot of attention. Absolutely, so yeah. this is a very important initiative for us. Fiona, can you describe for us, you're a registered nurse and you deliver wound care in your role. What does the uh, Reducing Foot Complication BPSO or Best Practice Spotlight Organization guideline tell us to do differently than what you did before? The difference between what we've been doing before and what we're doing now with this new guideline is as soon as a patient is coming into the hospital, we're assessing the diabetic foot. So we're assessing the patient's sensation, um, we're using monofilaments, which is a little piece of plastic which will gently touch the bottom of the patient's foot to see whether or not they can feel it we will be looking for just the appearance of the foot, whether or not it has healthy skin or healthy toes. But most importantly, we're assessing the patient's knowledge, how they're taking care of their feet at home, if they know what they're doing, and if there's any gaps in their knowledge that I could fill in. So prevention is a big key, and it sounds like that's what some of this initiative is trying to do, is really look at uh, diabetic foots um, before a problem starts. Absolutely, we have an opportunity to catch these um, 
diabetic foot complications before anything happens. If somebody's walking through the doors and they have de decreased sensation in their feet, we can move them forward to, with education and knowledge in order to avoid any more complications. So Heather, thank you for joining us today. Okay. You're, you're a patient and I, I understand you're a diabetic. I'm a diabetic, yeah. And you've had a, a wound complication, have you? No, I haven't actually. Oh, uh, congratulations. <laughs> That's great. Um, I've been very lucky. I got involved with the diabetic foot management people after my doctor had a little bit of a shock when I told him I got cut after having a pedicure. And he oh. said, oh no, no more pedicures for you. This is where you go. So I thought, well, I'll take his advice. And off I went, and I've been going there ever since, and they've been helping me take care of my feet. So listening to these folks talk about prevention, that's what I'm trying to do, is it's, to look after things ahead of time. It's absolutely critical. And any other advice that you might have to give for other listeners who might have diabetes? In anything I've heard, it seems that don't wait. Get on with things right away. Don't say, okay, I'll look after that later. I'll make a New Year's resolutions to take care of it. You've got to do it right now, because that's how you look after things with diabetes. And I understand a statistic that if diabetics had annual foot exams, it would actually reduce the rate of amputation within this country uh, significantly. Yeah, so really prevention is the key yeah. for good care. Um, now Rob, you just showed me a little bit of a package um, that you provide for diabetic patients within our organization. Talk to me a little bit about what's in that package and I noticed a, an interesting pamphlet there called Do's and Don'ts. So right. Well, the, uh, mono, there's the monofilament, just to show that, that uh, Theon had mentioned a second ago that, that we used to touch. So I, I look at my, this package is a one-stop shopping uh, place to, for the nurses on the units to get the information and to do the assessment. The, the pamphlet, the information that's given to the patient includes a little bit about uh, some creams, some community resources, and then this, as you mentioned, the do's and don'ts. Some of the simple do's and don'ts would be things like make sure that you have uh, an assessment done with your healthcare professional. Uh, when you're with them, ensure you're taking off your shoes and having them assess their feet. Um, the neuropathies uh, that we assess for using the monofilament test are a big indicator of the worry or potential for developing a foot ulcer. So another do's and don'ts would be make sure that you check your shoes carefully before you put them on, that something hasn't fallen into them. Make sure you wear shoes all the time, slippers at home, Always shoes when you go outside, never take a chance walking around without shoes on so you know you're protecting your feet because un unfortunately people with diabetes and neuropathies will, won't be able to tell if they've cut or injured their mm -hmm. feet and it becomes much more of a problem for them. Some of the other do's and don'ts are be cautious, be extremely cautious when going to have a <laughs> pedicure done. When you're cutting your own toenails, make sure that they're cut straight and not on angles. If you do notice a cut, treat it very seriously, uh, even uh, to the point where you may want to seek professional help if you should cut your feet or damage your feet in any way. Um, other creams, ointments, how to manage, who to help, who to get support mm -hmm. from, who to uh, encourage your family members to help be involved with this so that they know the, the risks and are available to help you out should you at some point need their assistance to manage some of these things. Not everyone's able to easily check the bottom of their feet mm -hmm. and that's something that should be done daily is checking your bottom of your feet so if you may need your help of your partner to, uh, to help manage that type of care or inspection. Right. Yeah. Now Fiona, education is a really critical component of we, as we just heard from Rob. So how do you build education into the work that you do? Or is that the bulk of the work? Uh, a lot of the time it's a discussion. Um, when we get the diabetic in inpatient, they're usually there for another reason. They're not in the hospital to have their feet checked. So a lot of the time it comes kind of as a surprise. When I walk into the patient's room and they're getting ready for a surgery and I'm, do you mind if I take a look at your feet? And I'm asking them about education and on their feet. On, on their feet. Um, usually, usually that's an opportunity to catch them at a surprise and we'll really find out what they know about diabetic foot care. Um, that, that, that's when we can find the gaps in their knowledge. Uh, so Heather, you mentioned that you go now to a diabetic center mm -hmm. to get your feet assessed. What do they actually do in that in that center? Uh, they is it like a pedicure? A, well, <laughs> yes and no. They um, give my feet a really good inspection. They cut the toenails. They file all the calluses off, and give me the good old lecture about making sure I keep them well and truly moisturized every night. And I hate the feeling of cream, but knowing I'm going to get that lecture, I do it. <laughs> <laughs> so, so there's benefit. 
Other tips about managing a chronic disease, because diabetes is much more than just a food yeah. uh, foot inspection. Um, it, it's just it's just always there. You can never take a holiday from it. You can't get away from it. But if you just sort of always have it in the back of your mind, you can just keep going and not worry about it too much. And I understand eye exams are also important yes. for diabetics. Yeah, and I have it every year, and my doctor's very careful about making sure he asks me that question every time I go to see him. Oh, that's excellent. Yeah, yeah. So eye exams are important annually, foot exams are important yes. annually. Anything else in managing diabetes that yeah. you would say? Just keep track of everything because something can change very quickly and so know, know what's happening with your own blood sugars and what's going on and stay active. And so Rob, uh, can you tell us a little bit more? Are you tracking your outcomes and yeah, and that's been really uh, a f relatively easy thing to do. I was very fortunate w to work with our decision support people, and they were able to write a very sim a neat little program that checks in the background, uh, looks at the medications the patients are admitted with, and anyone that was on any type of insulin or hypoglycemic medication is then determined to be diabetic or have diabetes, I should say. Uh, from there, it's just three other thing, uh, three other simple things: have they had the education? Have they had the monofilament test? and have they had the assessment done. Very simple stuff and uh, we're doing really well in the units we're on. We're usually at least 70 to 80 percent compliance rate. Uh, it's, it's a relatively short, simple uh, assessment, a little bit of education, and then it becomes part of the permanent record so that we can see later on how things are going. Measuring. And is that right across the organization? We're getting there. We're on okay. six units so far and it's about three or four units of Credit Valley. So it's, it's growing. We're, we're doing reasonably well, but we've, got, we've still got some work to do. So we're, we're closing in on it. Great. Yeah. And Rob or Fiona, what about partnerships with the community? So we discharge patients from our hospital. Is there any kind of link with our community partners on this initiative? There's a couple of links that we've been established. Um, people from uh, Coloplast have uh, given me a great deal of education, uh, educational materials, uh, samples for the, the cream that you were talking about a minute ago to make sure that the uh, people's feet are, are moisturized, preventing cracks. Certainly, the Diabetes Management Center uh, it requires a uh, referral from a family physician, so we try to connect with the family physicians to make sure they know what's, what's available and, what's, um, and how, how to connect with the Diabetes Management Center. So there's a few community sort of resources like that that have been helpful, really helpful in, in, in promoting this, this, this educational uh, initiative. And Fiona, any advice that you want to give either to patients or to other healthcare providers? I would just, kind of what Heather was saying, just to motivate the person or the patient to check their feet every day. It's really important to take a look at your toes and the bottom of your feet to see if there's any changes going on. Um, oftentimes we have the elderly person who doesn't have the ability to lift their foot and unfortunately they might not have somebody at home who can look at them as well. So I often suggest to just get a little mirror, a little mirror to sit on the couch and they can look at the bottom of their feet. So oh, we try to- that's a great idea. Just think, think of different <coughs> ways to get people to look at their feet every single day because a teeny little scratch can grow into a mountain and we can have much bigger problems on our hands. Okay, well I wanna thank uh, the three of you for joining us today. I certainly learned a lot more around diabetic foot complications than I did before. Um, and I want our viewers to stay tuned for after the break because we are going to learn more around smoking cessation and I'm sure that smoking cessation is probably something also Heather that you hear about mm -hmm. uh, as you learn more around your disease and diabetes so I think smoking cessation applies for uh, a large part of our population uh, so stay tuned uh, after the break. back to Talk Trillium, partnering for ba patients. Today joining me is Priti Patel. Priti is the manager of smoking cessation, primary care, and seniors health at Trillium Health Partners. And we have Robin Pohl, who's a cardiovascular rehab tech 
and also the smoking cessation champion. Now we all know that smoking and quitting smoking is good for us uh, both in the short term and long term, has long lasting effects uh, for our health. And uh, with a lot of determination and education, uh, many patients can be successful in their journey to improve their health by quitting smoking. And so it's really our delight to have both of you joining here today to share with us how Trillium Health Partners is helping patients quit smoking at a very uh, opportunistic time, I would say. And that's when they encounter uh, the healthcare system for real and it sometimes gives them a little bit of a jolt and inspires them to quit smoking. So as the smoking cessation champion, Robin, tell me a little bit about what that smoking cessation journey looks like. Uh, I work in the cardiovascular care program. Uh, when a patient comes into the hospital with a heart event, so a heart attack or needing surgery, we actually first meet them at bedside and ask them if they need help or if they would like to stop smoking. We advise them on the fact that it's one of the best things they can do for their health to stop smoking. When they come to our program, it's an education and exercise program uh, for their heart health, and we assess if they are in need of help in stopping smoking. And I, the thing about smoking cessation is it's never too late. Whether you're 40 years old or 80 years old, there are always benefits from quitting smoking, as I understand it. Yes, even in just 48 hours, you can improve your health by not smoking. Uh, you reduce the amount of carbon dioxide in the blood, more oxygen in the blood to feed the cells, less damage to the cells. It's it's that quick a change. So in 48 hours, there can be very positive effects on your physical health. Yes. And so yes. how long does it take to become, for your lungs to be, return to normal state after you quit smoking? Is that known? Uh, the, the difficult thing with your lungs is once the alveoli are damaged, they don't recover. However, uh, you can reduce your risk of another heart event within a year. It, within 15 years, you have the same risk of a heart event as someone who never smoked. And pretty, um, you are the manager overseeing <coughs> smoking cessation across the organization. Tell me a little bit about that program and what does that look like? Um, so as, as Robin has highlighted, um, the, the key part of the program is really uh, making sure that we ask all of our patients um, their smoking status and assess their readiness to quit. So some individuals, um, you know, you walk into the room and they're ready to quit. Other individuals, it may take a few tries. And um, as Robin highlighted, it's advising them the importance of quitting. And then the key piece uh, for us is really offering them strategies for withdrawal management, um, smoking cessation medication, um, uh, counseling, and then ensuring that there is follow-up for them. So uh, our program is, is quite comprehensive. Um, and the other uh, elements to our program um, is also helping to build capacity um, uh, within our organization. So um, making it easy for our um, our staff to have that conversation uh, with patients and, and their families uh, about the importance of quitting. Now when a patient gets admitted to hospital, I know uh, we don't allow smoking on the premises. Right. So what do we do for patients that were heavy smokers before they came into hospital, are now admitted to hospital? Is there something we can do to prevent them from actually experiencing wanting a, a cigarette? Uh, yes, absolutely, um, and that's why um, it's really important that we ask um, uh, really quickly and usually within 24 to 48 hours of admission. Um, and there are lots of um, uh, different types of smoky cessation medications, uh, whether it's a patch, inhaler, um, there's lots of um, things that we can help uh, to help our patients with the withdrawal symptoms that they're experiencing. And, and Robin, is there, yes. a, um, is there a prescription or something that you always order in order to help patients quit smoking? The patch, for instance, or? Uh, well, 
When I am advising patients and assisting the ones that have decided they would like to quit, that they have set a quit day, I offer them advice on different types of medications that could help them. Uh, for instance, uh, you said a prescription. I'm not a doctor, I can't prescribe them the medication, but I can advise them on things that are over the counter, like a nicotine patch. And the general rule is one milligram to one cigarette. So if a person normally would smoke seven cigarettes per day, I would advise them try to start with a seven milligram nicotine patch. Um, we can advise them on other options that they could talk to their physician with, about, sorry, um, like something called Champix. It's a type of medication uh, that really helps people um, not feel the urge to smoke as much, or another medication uh, called Zyban. But again, that's a, a, a physician would prescribe a medication like that. All the medications work best when people get support, support from family, support from friends, support from medical educators, and of course, in the cardiac rehab program, support from someone like myself, the exercise leaders. And so the support, when people are discharged from our organization, what kind of support can they expect from our community? Is there support? There is a lot of support, and, and you just have to ask, you just have to look. Uh, you can go to your own pharmacist, mm -hmm. and your pharmacist can give you support with medication and counseling. Um, Mississauga is amazing. Uh, the Peel Health Program, you can contact them and get support. Um, the Canadian Cancer Society mm -hmm has an amazing website, uh, something called the Smokers Helpline. You don't have to call, you can email, you can text, uh, you can pick up uh, resources. Is there, there a phone number that you want to share with our viewers? Sure. I'll show you some of the pamphlets from um, the Canadian Cancer Society. And on the back is the phone number for the Smokers Helpline. But this is a little card that we do give our patients. Uh, the telephone number is one eight seven seven. Sorry, I don't see very well. Five one three five three three three. Great, thank you. So those are additional resources for people out in the community. Yes, and, and we also have um, uh, an interactive uh, voice recognition. It's it's uh, called Telask, and so if patients consent. Um, uh, three days after they're discharged um, from uh, from the hospital, they can receive an automated telephone call, and the 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 system will call them up to eight times and follow them for about six months. And at any time during uh, that uh, telephone call, if you uh, want to talk to somebody uh, live, then you can press um, to get the smokers helpline, and then you would be able to connect with a live person who can then help support you as well. So that's another. Um, uh, piece that we have to support our patients um, after they've been discharged from the hospital. It seems like maybe a breakthrough strategy is important as well because sometimes it's just that sudden urge and if they could just get through the next few minutes they can they can somehow sustain their desire to quit smoking and I think Nicorette gums are sometimes a fast relief. Is that still a recommended strategy uh, Robin? That's one strategy. What we, we say is try the four D's Oh. So D for to delay, so delay the thought of smoking for a few minutes. Uh, D for drink, have a drink of water. Um, distract yourself, you know, call a friend. Call a friend. I like that um, option. <laughs> and for some reason, delay, distract, drink. I, for some reason, I have forgotten the fourth D. <laughs> I, I think that could head, apply for almost anything. Yes. If we were on a diet and we wanted to <laughs> delay eating another piece of food, yeah. that would help as well. Yeah. I, I think the key is that um, you want to know what are the reasons, what are the, your triggers for smoking, and making sure that you have other options available. So if you are the type of individual who has breakfast and then you always have a cigarette afterwards, well, now that you're going to, part of your plan is, okay, 
after breakfast, what am I going to do? And so thinking of something distracting, maybe I'm going to go for a quick walk so I'm not thinking about having that cigarette. So you really have to sort of uh, plan and uh, make sure that you understand what your triggers are. And that's got an added benefit, of course, of adding activity because often Absolutely. weight gain is a concern uh, once we quit smoking. Right. So that's a good replacement for smoking. Yep. And what are the impacts of smokers in our healthcare system, Pretty? Are there any statistics um, on that? Uh, yeah, there, there's actually, um, you know, so for example, on any given day um, across Canada, there are about 23,000 beds that are occupied by smokers. Um, and there's also a huge financial cost. So um, th it costs the healthcare system uh, 1.6 billion uh, dollars, but it's not just the cost to the healthcare system. There's also the the cost of lost productivity, uh, which is another 4.4 uh, 4, uh, 4 .4 billion dollars. So, um, smoking-related cost uh, that's about six billion dollars. So, think about all of the wonderful programs and services that um, six billion dollars um, uh, could go to to supporting. And I guess the, the other piece to remember it's, uh, is not just the cost, but also um, smokers tend to live 10 years less um, than non-smokers. So um, it's important from a, a life and a quality of life perspective as well. Wow, I wasn't aware of that statistic. So smokers actually live 10 years less yes. than others who don't smoke. Right. And if that isn't a, a rationale for quitting smoking, I'm not sure what would be. So thank you so much for sharing all of your insights into smoking cessation today and how our best practices actually help our patients uh, in the long term as well as the short term. Uh, for our viewers at home, if you need any further information about anything that we've talked about today, um, please visit our website at www.trilliumhealthpartners.ca. It was great to learn more about how the organization is lifting best practices right across all three sites in these very specific areas, and we look forward to hearing more. Thanks for joining.